Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Church. Whether you are here in person or watching online or listening later this afternoon on the radio, we are glad that you have paused to worship. As we begin, I want to invite you to take a deep breath. I was reminded this week that I hadn't done that in a while, and some folks missed it. And this week is a good time to pause and breathe deeply, to be inspired to breathe in God's presence, to ground ourselves in God's love and grace and to recognize those times when we need to change. The theme this day is an invitation to a Holy Lent, which is the season that begins on Ash Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. It's a time of taking stock and making changes. For example, one other thing I did this week is I got a new remote. Because for each of the last four weeks, at some point in the service, something had gone wrong because I had misused the technology I had. And some, it might have been the remote's fault. Man, it was me. That's Lent. You identify a problem, you make a change. You identify an opportunity, you make a change. You are intentional about drawing closer to God in your word and in your deed. And I think for the first time since I've been here at first, today's reading comes from the lectionary. Because sometimes the season of the church year and sometimes the way the lectionary goes, you just can't do better than that. And so we're going to hear a perhaps familiar story, a mystery, an invitation into discipleship. I invite you to stand and join in worship with our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in his lands. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for his wonderful works. He satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things, and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Please remain standing and join in singing our opening hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. It's number 103 in the Red United Methodist Hymnal.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. 
It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they did not understand this saying. Its meaning was concealed from them so that they could not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Our hymn of preparation is uh, number 451 in the hymnal. I invite you to remain standing and join in singing, Be Thou My Vision. You may be seated. I want to introduce you this day to this icon. It's known as the Virgin of Kiev or Our Lady of Kiev. It was written in 1132 at the request of Prince Mislav of Kiev, who was building a new cathedral near the city, and he commissioned this piece from a Byzantine iconist, iconographer. It, of course, depicts the Madonna and Child, Mary, and the infant Jesus, a scene of incarnation. It's an important image in the history of the church, particularly the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And it's an image that my Lutheran grandmother had a copy of. 
just a small postcard that she'd gotten on one of her travels. She'd never been to Ukraine, but at some point she had come across this. And so I, without knowing any of the history, had seen this image along with a number of Madonna and child figurines. And I've shared before, it was my Lutheran grandmother that collected them. My Catholic grandmother thought all the Mariology was kind of silly. And by the time I got old enough to understand theologically how weird that was, I think it explains a lot about my journey. But it is a beautiful image of peace and hope. It's often compared to the Mona Lisa in terms of style and the facial recognition and the feeling that people have when they observe it. In 11... 64, it was removed to the city of Vladimir before that king, uh, Prince Andrew Bobulski, uh, destroyed Kiev. And then in the 19th century, it was, excuse me, in the 14th century, it was taken from Vladimir to Moscow. And it's now in the Tretyakov Gallery there in Moscow. It's an important work of world art and a treasure of Ukrainian cultural heritage. It proclaims the truth of incarnation and it gives evidence to the complicated history of Russia and Ukraine and how often the church is embroiled in and complicit with the empires of the world. There's a lot to unpack in this icon. I also want to share with you a modern treasure, a poem by the late Anne Weems. She is sometimes called the poet laureate of the Presbyterian Church. I have a number of her books of prose and poetry. She's one of those people that seems to be able to capture a moment and to express that moment in near universal terms. So I want to share with you a provocatively named poem by Ann Weems, I No Longer Pray for Peace. She writes, on the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tender-heartedness, and evil intentions will turn to mercifulness. And all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way, and the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and its wine. Some say there is no hope. But then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly love one another. I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. The season of Lent is about miracles. It's about the scandalous notion that God loves us and that we can love neighbor and that we can change. Faith is always about a connection with others. We don't do faith alone. We need each other. We are to love even our enemies, Jesus says. It's challenging because we always want to change them. We don't want to change ourselves, but the way grace works is it changes us. I have a friend who post a breath prayer on a regular basis. 
We'll talk more about breath prayers later in Lent, but his most common breath prayer, it's one sentence, it's change me, O God, and make us one. He's been posting that on Facebook every day for weeks now, and it's starting to sink into me. Change me, O God, and make us one. We are on the cusp of Lent. I've said before, one of the things I love about the Christian calendar is that it gives us opportunities to start again over and over. We begin the year with Advent in late November or December. We spend four intentional weeks leading up to Christmas, one of the high holy days of our faith, the celebration of Christ's birth that God becomes flesh and dwells among us, Emmanuel. We sing hymns, we share light in the midst of darkness. And then a week later, the world catches up and we celebrate New Year. And we enter into a new calendar year in the season of Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas run from the 25th until Epiphany on January 6th. We are in the midst of this holy celebration as the calendar turns. We celebrate the new beginning of Christ's birth. We celebrate the new beginning of Epiphany. We celebrate the story of Jesus as he begins his ministry And then very quickly, in late February or early March, Lent begins. A new time of beginning. An opportunity to pause, to take stock, to recognize when a change is needed. I got a new remote with a big button that feels different. The one I'm supposed to push. The others feel different, so I'll know that I'm not supposed to push that button in the middle of worship. It's a simple thing. And yet it took me a month to realize the problem was I was putting my finger on the wrong button. So I solved the problem by getting a remote that tells me I'm on the right button. That's Lent. That's taking stock and recognizing that we need to make a change. It wasn't about decrying the person that designed the other remote that put the buttons too darn close together. Clearly their fault. Never mind that I used that remote for something like six years without issue. But something had changed. The tool wasn't working properly anymore. The user was at fault. We found a solution. That's Lent. We stay in this season of penitence and preparation until Easter. The celebration that darkness does not have the final word, that suffering and death are not the end of the story, that war and violence are not God's will, that love has already won. But in order to recognize that love has won, we need to reset. And so in this season of Lent, we'll be following a book by the late Junius Dotson called Soul Reset. And it's full of practices to center ourselves in God's presence and holiness, to recognize when we need to make changes, simple or complex, to give us tools to make those changes. You are invited to a holy Lent. We begin on Ash Wednesday, 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We'll have long-standing traditions and some new practical practices to help you let go of what burdens you, to recognize how Christ is equipping you to take new things on, to center ourselves in this season. One of the traditions of that day I want to share with you this day It's a reading from our book of worship. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, 
there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the universal church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, by reading and meditating on God's holy word. I've talked several times recently about how I choose themes for worship, the process of prayer and discernment, and at least here, there's some churches where I have followed the lectionary for various reasons and some places where I haven't, and when I got here, my sense was that we needed to hear some additional stories that we needed to weave into some different ways. But I always start in my own devotion reading the lectionary because the councils that develop that, that walk us through the seasons of the church year and highlight stories with the hope that churches from different denominations might have common text, that when we all go to lunch afterwards, we might have something in common to talk about and to compare. To hear a larger message than just our own denominational concerns. And there's some real wisdom to that. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And I, I had a plan, I'd actually set it to Pat for what we were going to do today. This last Sunday before Lent. And I kept turning back to the lectionary and particularly the story of transfiguration. Two and three weeks ago, it kept popping to mind. It kept coming up. And some of that's because all of my preacher friends were preparing for Transfiguration Sunday, but more of it was in my own devotion, my own reading. It kept coming across this story. And as I read some of the commentaries, I realized one of the things we often do with the lectionary, there's four readings assigned each Sunday. Almost nobody does all four of them. We pick two of them. And then we read part of those two. And so we have a canon within a canon within a canon, and we don't hear the fullness of Scripture. And in the lectionary reading, it goes on beyond the transfiguration, back down the mountain to the healing. And the text actually goes on to the second prediction of Christ's death. And we don't want to hear that. It's much easier to stay in that mo holy moment of light and hope and wonder. It gets messy when we come back down the mountain and there's someone in need crying out. And it gets really messy when Jesus tells his disciples he will be betrayed. As I've been reading and thinking about that text, Psalm 23 has also kept coming to mind. This isn't part of the lectionary for this day. But I was interested by the compare and the contrast of the feelings of the readings. The state, the inspired state, the author of 23 must have been in to write these words. The kind of space I think people like Ann Weems often got into to express so profoundly hope and grace and God's presence. The Lord is my shepherd. By tradition, David wrote these words, I shall not want. God provides. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. My soul is restored. A sense of wholeness and completeness and enough of setting aside burdens and worry and striving and just being confident of God's provision. He leads me on right paths for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death is the King James version of that next line. We heard a more literal translation, when I walk in the darkest valley. The image on the screen is from last week. It's Wesley's journey to the Americas. He encounters a storm, a dark valley, if you will. He's full of doubt and confusion. He and the crew are sure they're about to perish, and the Moravian pietists on board are singing praises to God. God is with them. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. I'm going to try something real quick. I think we might be getting feedback over here. Nope, that wasn't it. (laughs) We'll keep trying. He anoints my head with oil. A shepherd would anoint a sheep's head with oil to keep away pests, to help particularly the male sheep when they were butting heads and trying to express dominance to do so without hurting themselves. It's also a symbol of God's wholeness and call. We proclaim Christ as Messiah. It literally means anointed one. David was an anointed one. We anoint at baptism, participating in Christ's death and resurrection and accepting for ourselves and those we baptize a call to servanthood. A recognition of God's provision, blessing, abundance, and call. God who is transcendent our first hymn said, hidden in light and yet with us on the journey. The season of Lent is about recognizing that God is with us on the journey that we are called to journey with God, to follow in Christ's footsteps. Peter and James and John are invited to go to a secluded place and pray with Jesus. We don't know why those three are invited, why the other disciples are left at the foot of the mountain. The scene has great parallels to Moses' call to journey to speak with God. While they're there, Jesus is transfigured. He is bathed in light. His face changes. He is revealed This human one as the fullness of God, just as his baptism, a voice speaks. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him, God says. In the midst of fear and the cloud, these disciples are told to listen. That scene doesn't stand on its own. Luke 9 is a profound chapter. It begins with the first mention of the disciples in the Gospel of Luke since they were called. At the beginning of Luke 9, Jesus sends them out two by two. And he charges them with sharing not only the message, but God's power. He gives them command over demons and illnesses. They are to heal to change people's lives in physical, mental, emotional, spiritual ways. He expects them to be able to do what he has been doing. And they go, and they do. And they return excited that they have been filled with the Spirit, that they have shared that with others in physical ways, And again, they are overwhelmed. They can't see a possibility. There are too many people here to feed. Send them away, Jesus. Jesus provides God's abundance. The multitude are fed. There are leftovers. Twelve baskets full. And they journey on and 
having experienced this power and shared it, having seen God's abundance and the twelve basket full, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And the answers are John the Baptist or a prophet. But Peter says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus immediately proclaims that he will suffer and die and he calls on his disciples, anyone who will follow him, to deny themselves and take up their cross daily. It's a hard word. 2,000 years have passed, we're still debating what it means to take up our cross. I don't think it's to seek suffering or death, but it is to join with Christ in doing good, in proclaiming God's glory and love, even when it's unpopular, even when it seems weak. To willingly enter into service. To take up our cross is to follow Christ. To feed the hungry. To clothe the naked. To shelter those without shelter. It's hard, it's difficult. Yet that is our call. And in doing those things, we begin to see and experience the glory of God. We get to see and experience the fullness of God in our midst. can channel God's presence, can share God's love and grace and power with more than thoughts and prayers, but with action. All of the injustices of the world are tied together. It may seem like we are powerless in the face of evil, and yet we bear light that darkness cannot overcome. And sometimes we bear responsibility for changing systems that create injustice, systems we didn't create, but that very often we have benefited from. To recognize need. Jesus comes down the mountain, and the other disciples are with a crowd, and there's a commotion, and a distraught father cries out, Teacher! Heal my son. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do it. I tend to read this in Mark. Luke tells the story slightly differently. Maybe it's a little more on point. Jesus is angry, frustrated. How long must I be with this perverse generation? Who does he say that to? It doesn't seem like a reasonable response to the father who is calling out. I think he's talking to his disciples. Maybe especially the three that were just accompanying him on that journey of prayer, but aren't saying anything about what they'd seen. Maybe it's all 12 of them that just a few verses ago had the power and now are filled with doubt and excuses and ineptitude. Jesus heals the boy and gives him back to his father. This father with his only son all apparently that he has in the world. Jesus gives him back. Creates a form of justice, a form of opportunity. And then he says to his disciples, let this sink into your ears. Hear this. The Son of Man will be betrayed but they don't hear it. In fact, the Scripture says they're kept from hearing it. It's a 
curious line. Is God who just told Peter and James and John to listen to him, preventing them from hearing? Is it their own giving in to temptation and doubt and seeing impossibilities and not wanting to hear what Jesus has to say that prevents them from hearing? We didn't read it, but if we go on to the next passage, as they begin to journey to the next place, the next miracle Jesus will perform, they're arguing amongst themselves who is the greatest. They still seem to think that Jesus is about overthrowing a particular political system in a particular time and place, not revealing the kingdom of God in all times and places. They haven't yet entered into his humility. That in itself is a betrayal. It's not just Judas that betrays. It's all of us when we fail to be intentional about our discipleship. When we prevent ourselves from listening. Letting it sink deeply into our ears. A couple weeks ago we heard Paul's plea to let a divided community have the mind that was in Christ. To enter into his humility. To recognize the fullness of God dwelling among us. To recognize the power that he gives us as disciples. To find a way to let love and grace overcome our differences even as we stand up to evil and reject temptation and yes, even correct each other when we perceive one another to be wrong. But to do that with such humility that we share the love of Christ. David is said to have written another psalm. And often on Ash Wednesday we read Psalm 51. When David, who has been convicted of his own sinfulness, is in the midst of repenting, he writes, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. The one that David knows as his shepherd, as his provider, the one who has anointed him can make him whole even in the face of David's sinfulness and selfishness and brokenness. And so I want to close this day with another prayer. I invite you to say these words with me. Lord, make me a channel of your peace. That where there is hatred, I may bring love. Where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. Let us reflect on those words for a moment. And continue. Where there is discord, I may bring harmony. Where there is error, I may bring truth. Where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there is despair, I may bring hope. Take this opportunity to breathe deeply of God's grace and love as we continue. Where there are shadows, I may bring light. Where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted. To understand more than to be understood. To love more than to be loved. For it is by forgetting self that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen.
Lent is an opportunity to go deep. To go beyond a trivial sacrifice to earnestly praying that a clean heart and a renewed spirit would be granted to us. To recognize that the Lord is our shepherd, that the Lord leads us on paths for His name's sake. To recognize that whatever challenges we face, our cup truly does overflow. Because there is nothing, no power, no entity, no trouble or tribulation, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Not even our own stubbornness, ultimately. God is patient and kind. God calls us to follow. That's what I believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It's number 384 in the hymn. I want to share a couple of announcements. There are a number on the back of the bulletin that I encourage you to look over. Uh, Joey Bierbauer wants to thank everyone for the cards and prayers in uh, the death of his grandfather Earl. Uh, his graveside will be tomorrow at uh, National Cemetery. And you may have heard that uh, Tom Coyne will be 
retiring from uh, feeding families in his name. Tom has been one of the other mainstays of that group, uh, taking inventory and doing a lot of the cooking and uh, kitchen work. Uh, Bonnie and Tom Breaker and I have been uh, already working on how to uh, try and fill those shoes, but that's another place that we're going to be needing some volunteers. Uh, in particular, he has often come at uh, odd hours to accept shipments from various vendors and uh, to put those into inventory. And so there is another opportunity for some folks to step up and help maintain that ministry. And as we uh, go through March, as we get to April, when Tom is going to step back, we will find a time to uh, honor him for his work with that. Because it's been, what, seven years, Tom? So it's been a while that Tom has been helping out with that. And I do want to invite you to Ash Wednesday, 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday night here in the sanctuary. And if you haven't heard or met her yet, uh, we do have a new secretary in the office. Zandra Hood uh, will be working 12 hours a week. She'll be here 9 to noon, Monday through Thursday. You may recognize that that's substantially fewer hours than Marla had been working. And in the newsletter that has just come out, there is a, an article called The Rest of the Plan that outlines kind of what uh, I and uh, some of our leadership have in mind that we'll be working to use the rest of those hours to better equip us to do some ministry with young families and the community in the coming months. So be aware that uh, Zandra is in here. She uh, will be here Monday through Thursday. And because she's only working 12, she is not going to do nearly everything that Marla had been doing for us. And so again, there are some opportunities for some volunteers to step in and help with things like visitor bags and history, and there's some more information on that in the newsletter as well. Uh, that has been emailed out. It's also available to pick up here, or we, e we mailed it out to a handful of folks. Uh, if you would like to receive it by mail, let us know, or by email, let us know. And I encourage you to read over that uh, revamped email. And I also want to highlight that uh, March is another one of our Beacon Sunday months. Uh, last fall, when we were having all the fun with the Presbyterians and doing the, the challenge we each, do each fall, uh, we averaged about 200 items a week. And I'm challenging us to keep that up this spring because the need the Beacon serves goes year-round. Whether we're trading fun trophies with the Presbyterians, well, I guess we don't trade, we just tend to keep it. But <laughs> if we're having that kind of fun, if we're just doing it on our own, I challenge us to bring 200 items each week. And again, you can just set them up here or bring them by the office and we will get them to the beacon. So with that, let us enter into a time of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this beautiful day, for the sunshine, for the crisp breeze that lets us know we're alive. We thank you even though we may grumble about the ice and snow and the moisture that it brings to renew the face of the earth, to prepare the earth for a new season of growing. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in freedom for worship. We think of our brothers and sisters around the world huddled in subway tunnels and secret places We thank you for the opportunity to be generous with the resources that you have given us, to recognize your abundance in our lives, in our time, in our talent, in our treasure. We ask that you would create a new heart in us, that you would help us take care of the gifts you have given us, including our bodies and our minds, and yet not be so filled with self that we do not hear or see the need of our neighbor. Let us walk in the paths that you show us, knowing that on mountaintops and in deepest valleys you are with us, that nothing can separate us from your love. That when we intentionally fill ourselves and 
share that love with others, the kingdom that you proclaim becomes ever more fully true. We pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit and the name of your anointed one, Jesus the Christ, who taught us these words we now say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to reflect on God's abundance in your life, and your plans for this upcoming Lenten season as we hear the offertory. was lost in sin but Jesus took me in and then a little light from heaven filled my soul it made my heart in love and wrote my name above and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole now let us have a little talk with Jesus let us tell him all about our troubles he will hear our just cry and he will answer, answer by and by now when you feel a little prayer wheel turning and you know a little fire is burning you will find a little talk with jesus makes it right it makes it right sometimes my path seems drear without a ray of cheer and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer wheel turning and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer wheel turning and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It makes it right. Find a little talk with Jesus. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy One, we come each Sunday in celebration, confident of our faith and the talents you have granted us. Then the world wears us down. We get distracted. We give in to, well, we seek temptation. 
We get caught up in what we can't do, or we seek to control what you are already doing. As we worship today, and as we enter into this holy season of Lent, remind us again that you are with us, that you have called us, that you send us, that we are ultimately home when we recognize, respond to, and share your presence and power. Let us be a joyful and healing presence to all the world. Amen. Our closing hymn is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. It's number 474. May the Lord lift up his face upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he comfort you. May he challenge you to be disciples, to be the body of Christ in this time and place. Let us go forth and be Christ to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.